Hi, it's Bruce Williams, and today I would like to present the first in a lecture series on the gross pathology of the eye. As I do at the beginning of all of my lectures, I want to thank the folks who have made their images available to me to put these lectures together, either directly or through online collections. And as I often do, I want to highlight some of the specialists in the area whose material you really should check out. Today I want to thank Dr. Dick DeBilzik and Dr. Leandro Teixeira from the Comparative Ocular Pathology Laboratory of Wisconsin. These guys are the specialists. They're far better at ocular pathology than I will ever be. And I would also encourage everybody to purchase a copy of Dr. DeBilzig's wonderful book, Veterinary Ocular Pathology. Today's lecture is going to focus on developmental diseases of the eye. Here are two eyes. The one on the right is much smaller, and this is microophthalmia here in an ox. Microphthalmia affects a wide range of species, most often when the development of the eye, which is a very complex interaction between a wide range of tissues, is interrupted. There are two forms of microphthalmia, primary and secondary. Primary is a developmental abnormality, and secondary is the result of infectious agents or trauma to the eye as it develops. Primary microphthalmus results from inadequate growth of the optic vesicle or early optic cup and is accompanied by a wide range of intraocular abnormalities. Another key to primary microphthalmus is the presence of a small palpebral fissure or the size of the space between the eyelids because the palpebral fissure size is determined by the size of the optic vessel during its contact with the overlying surface ectoderm. So if the eye is small and not developing well, that palpebral fissure is going to be small as well. Secondary microphthalmia generally has a normal palpebral fissure and orbit. And you will see this tiny little eye rattling around in a big orbit. Usually when the eye is small, there are significant abnormalities within the possibility of a normal, very small eye, which some people call nanophthalmus, is extremely unlikely. Luckily, regardless of the cause of microphthalmia, the poorly developed eye always has some pigmented tissue within it. So you can usually find it somewhere in that orbit, no matter how small it is. Here in a bovine is a classic developmental abnormality known as synophthalmus or poorly named cyclopia. And we'll look at why in just a moment. This results from ingestion of veratrum californicum generally between 12 to 16 days of age and the significant craniofacial, neurological, and ophthalmic abnormalities that accompany it. If consumed before 12 days, the result is generally fetal death. If con consumed during this period, there is a failure of cleavage of the neurologic system resulting in holoprosencephaly, aronencephaly, significant craniofacial abnormalities, and a fusion of the eyes in a single orbit because the toxic principles, cyclopamine, cyclopazine, and gervine, affect the genetic products of sonic hedgehog marker. And we have failure of cleavage into the normal two halves of the structure so that, I nor that I named earlier. This is why cyclopia is a poor name for this condition. We can see one cornea and a large fused eye sitting in a single orbit, but everything behind the cornea is duplicated to include lenses, to include retinas, and to include the optic nerve. And for completeness's sake, 
There is another window for maldevelopment in animals to ingest veratrum californicum between days 28 and 32, where you will have musculoskeletal abnormalities such as foreshortened legs and tracheal stenosis. Another fun variation in the development of the eye is seen in the guinea pig. This is known as the lethal white defect of guinea pigs. You've heard about it in horses, and this is it in guinea pigs, although it's a little different. The genetics are basically the same. The guinea pig on the right carries the roan allele, which is the red allele, and mixing or breeding two guinea pigs of the, that carry the roan allele will give you about 25% lethal white guinea pigs. You notice ocular abnormalities, they do have microphthalmus and significant defects and are often blind. They also have malocclusion or absolutely no dentition at all. They are albino, they are deaf, and they have very defective immune systems. So now you know the lethal white syndrome of guinea pigs as well as the lethal white syndrome of foals. Here's a wonderful picture by Dr. Guillermo Rimoldi of a collie with a condition known as collie eye, a form of primary microphthalmus. And we can see grossly that this palpebral fissure is somewhat small, which is our first clue as to microphthalmia. And, and this is a collie. So we would expect the constellation of defects known as collie. It doesn't affect just collies, it also affects Shetland sheepdogs and border collies and related breeds. Collie eye is an autosomal recessive defect, which is usually bilateral, but not always symmetrical. So you can have a variation in the degrees of development on either eye. Collie eye usually contains one or more of the following defects. Choroidal hypoplasia lateral to the optic disc, significant scleral defects, which may result in an outward bulging of the retina and uvea, retinal detachment, especially in these areas of coloboma formation, hemorrhage into the vitreous, and as a result of all of these inflammatory type of changes as well, pre fibrovascular membranes. A similar syndrome may also be seen in animals with a merle or colored dilute coat color. In affected animals, the most consistent finding of these is a characteristic area of choroidal hypoplasia lateral to the optic discs, which up in, in up to 35% of cases may form a true coloboma or a defect that affects all of the layers, including the sclera. The underlying genetic mutation is a homozygous deletion in the N N I get this right, the NHEJ1 gene. When we talk about colobomas, here's what is known as a normal coloboma. It is an outpouching in the area of the optic disc and the choroid just ventral to the optic disc is the most common and characteristic location. Colobomas are late defects in the development of the eye resulting from the incomplete fusion of the optic fissure, a normal slit which goes through the optic cup. This optic fissure normally closes in the last third of gestation and the part just ventral to the optic disc, or excuse me, the optic nerve is the last to close. If it stays open for too long, the developing retina will protrude through the cleft and the retina within will also show rosette formation as a form of retinal dysplasia. 
while they are best known as part of the Collie syndrome, they may occasionally be seen by themselves, with Basenjis having a breed predisposition. Very large defects or colobomas at the back of the eye are called scleral ectasia and occasionally may be as large as the globe itself in which they are referred to as retrobulbar cysts. One thing about ocular pathology is that you're going to learn an entirely new vocabulary if you want to keep up. Another variant of coloboma may be seen anywhere in the choroid. This is a form of choroidal hyperplasia known as an iris coloboma. Don't confuse this with iris hypoplasia in which the entire iris is diffusely thinned often seen in animals with very light irises like blue-eyed cats or albino animals. So let's talk about animals with blue irises. Blue-eyed cats are the most commonly known type of this defect but it can be seen in just about any species. There is a wide variation in the severity of this lesion and irises may be totally melanocytopenic or just melanopenic and partially colored. Basically this defect represents defective migration of pigmented cells from the neural crest during development. And white coat blue eyed cats will be deaf in a syndrome analogous to Wardenberg syndrome in people about 50% of the time. Dalmatians with blue eyes will be deaf about 30% of the time. This autosomal dominant syndrome is, has complete penetration for loss of pigmentation of the poorly colored iris, but incomplete penetration for deafness. In the ear, hypopigmentation results in abnormal intermediate cell formation of the stria vascularis. And the stria vascularis is what produces the endolymph. The lack of endolymph results in the degeneration of hair cells and ultimately collapse of the cochlear duct and degeneration of the spiral organ. Remember that these blue irises may also be affected by iris hyperplasia, resulting in a very thin iris when visualized histologically in cross-section and clinically they may appear to bulge anteriorly. Here are irises from an albino Hereford animal with total lack of melanocytes both in the iris stroma and the posterior iris epithelium. In partially colored eyes you may still have some residual melanocytes within the posterior irritable epithelium. Here is a set of eyes in this wonderful picture from Derek Mosier from a herd of 90 animals in Kansas with 60% of them having glass eyes like this, partial pigmentation. Another potential rule out for this condition would be a Brangus cattle with Chediac Higashi disease. Chidiak Higashi results from a lysosomal trafficking abnormality related to the LIST gene and results in the accumulation of abnormally large granules with the melanocytes and a wide range of other cells. In melanocytes, it results in the formation of giant melanosomes, which are passed only with difficulty from melanocytes to keratinocytes and does not give the normal black color. This is one of the least of the problems with the Chediac Agashi animals 
because this fusion of uh, lysosomes will affect a wide range of inflammatory cells like neutrophils, making them unable to mount a proper immune response. Here is a common and usually incidental finding of eyes known as a persistent pupillary membrane. To ensure the proper development of the lens, there is a thick network of blood vessels which are at the front of the back and the back of the lens during development, known as the tunica vascularis lentis. During development, the anterior surface of the lens is covered by a sheet of mesenchyme and blood vessels which allow it to develop normally, normally but will break down before birth. Normally, it disappears completely. But occasionally, you will see some remaining endothelial structures which cross from one side of the anterior face of the iris to the other and will anchor either to the inside of the cornea and displace the corneal epithelium or will attach to the front of the lens which causes a fibrous change and loss of the anterior epithelium of the lens. Usually these don't cause much of a problem with vision but occasionally they do. You can see that all of the strands arise from the inner circle of the iris. Here is a, another great image of a persistent pupillary membrane, and you can see the defect just off to the side of the cornea. Having them anchored to the cornea is probably less of a problem than when they anchor posteriorly to the surface of the lens because ultimately they will form a small cataract. This is also an autosomal recessive problem in Basenjis who seem to have a lot of problems with their eyes. Here's a great picture from Dr. Ingeborg Langor from Louisiana State University and we talked about the changes when the sheet of mesenchyme providing nourishment to the developing lens doesn't break down in front of the eye. There is also a similar sheet in back and an artery that goes to nourish the posterior part of the lens during development known as the hyaloid artery. Sometimes this does not break down as it should and it is referred to as a persistent hyaloid artery often anchoring to the back of the retina, but not causing a lot of problems. However, if the part that breaks down is not as small, is, is considerably larger, and involves mesenchyme and spindle cells and contraction, the condition is known as a persistent hyperplastic primary vitreous and fibroblastic contraction can actually draw the retina away from the choroid and result in considerable vision defects. Here is one of the most common defects in dogs and cattle involving the eye congenital defect which might arise on the conjunctiva on the sclera or on the cornea and this is a corneal dermoid. This is actually a chorostoma which is normal tissue in an abnormal location. You're not supposed to have stratified squamous epithelium with that nexa to include hair follicles in your eye. It's a common defect and small ones can be easily surgically removed. Of course, anywhere that it is, there will be a scar, so it affects the cornea. There may be a vision problem later on. In Hereford cattle, these are considered to be a polygenic 
autosomal recessive problem. While the majority of dermoids generally have skin and hair follicles, you can have any tissue in them, including teeth. I'm not going to go into any depth in eyelid defects. Seem to be particularly prevalent in chickens, but you can see them in any species. And this chicken has a nice eyelid notch in this great picture from Dr. J. Holshue. You've heard of the term trichiasis and dystichiasis. This is a great image of a condition known as dystichiasis. In both conditions, abnormal placement of eyelashes or hairs from the eyelid cause irritation to the conjunctiva and cornea. This is dystichiasis, and dystichiasis is a particular problem in which hair shafts actually come out of the openings for the meibomian glands on the eyelid margins. Meibomian glands being modified sebaceous glands located at the mucocutaneous junction of the eyelid. You're not supposed to have any hair come out there, and it's pointed inward and is irritating to the eye. Trichiasis is a much wider term, which is used for abnormal positioning of the hair. It's often seen in animals with oddly shaped uh, eyelids or oddly shaped heads like brachycephalic diseases. Here's a great picture of what is normally a fairly non-pathogenic finding. These are iris cysts, and the epithelium in the posterior part of the iris is sort of odd. It's formed in two layers of epithelium which oppose each other, but are not really attached. There's tight junctions in between the cells, but not connecting the two layers. So anytime you have any type of vascular effusion within the iris or inflammation, fluid may leak out and it goes between these two layers, separating them and causing these iris or uveal cysts. The cysts are usually attached to the posterior part of the iris and occasionally will break off and when the animal moves its eye, will float around. If they get into the anterior chamber and touch the corneal endothelium, they may, may result in a corneal defect, but usually it's not a problem and Labradors and Golden Retrievers are predisposed to development of this. There is a syndrome which is pathologic in Golden Retrievers where these cysts get so big that they may cross the iris itself, resulting in an impairment of vision. Here is a normal structure in the horse on top and on the bottom of this iris called corpora nigra. Corpora nigra or similar structures are seen in a variety of ruminants and I'll show you why in a minute or at least the predisposing theory. This particular animal is developing a iris cyst arising for the corpora nigra. You may wonder what these structures being normal actually do and it's best illustrated in the eye of a llama. Look at these beautiful corpora nigra in the eye of this llama. Okay, so, so this llama lives on top of the mountain. And it's very, very sunny out there. Okay, and they don't have sunglasses, but when their pupil constricts, okay, because they're out in the bright sunlight, the pupil will come down and these two structures will interdigitate, sort of like a Venetian blind, providing additional protection against sunlight to the delicate structures of the inner eye. These corpora nigra are best developed in llamas and alpacas, but we've seen them in horses, and they're also present but not as prevalent 
in sheep and goats as well. Seems that you have to have a horizontal pupil for these structures to work properly as protection against ultraviolet light. Our last slide for the day is that of a snake. Just to remind you that the spectacle that covers the eye and the snake is a scale like any other scale and generally will be shed when the snake sheds being part of the skin of the snake essentially these spectacles are subject to any of the other skin diseases of snakes they may develop bacterial infections fungal disease mites or simply not be shed properly as a result of dysagdysis or abnormal shedding in snakes. At no time should they be peeled off because this may cause significant damage to the underlying eye. Well that covers developmental diseases of eyes from a general pathology point of view. If you purchase Dr. DeBill's book or you go to Coplow uh, Facebook or website, they will have many more uh, discussed in greater detail. But I hope this gives you a somewhat uh, good overview of developmental diseases of eyes. In the le next lecture, we will start to talk about infectious viral bacteria and fungal diseases that affect the eye in uh, a wide variety of species. Thanks so much for your attention. I hope that you enjoyed this video and also the other ones that are available through the Foundation's Facebook page and our YouTube channel. Have a great day.